Hi everyone. In this episode, we are chatting with Nikki To and Grace Mendez, two members of our cohort. As inclusive designers, their work is always stellar and they always seem to go the extra mile in what they're doing. Nikki has a fine arts background while Grace has a graphic design background, but somehow they found a path to collaborating with one another on their research to design more accessible space for children at Grandview Kids. This is a center in Ontario, Canada, which provides family-centered pediatric and rehabilitation services for children and youth with physical, communication, and developmental needs. Now, because of the pandemic, we haven't seen them in so, so long, and we didn't really know the outcome of the work that they were doing for so long. So we wanted to catch up and find out the results of their design research. And here is that conversation. We are very, very happy to have you guys with us today because we feel like we haven't seen you in forever. So this is a nice catch up uh, for us. So Tanya and I have a few questions. I don't know who necessarily to start with, because to me, you guys are like so tied together <laughs> in your projects. So first question we were thinking of is that we, we don't really know how you ended up in inclusive design. Like how did you, like Tanya and I are both graphic designers and we kind of wanted to have a more social impact and we found our way to the inclusive design program. But how did you guys both end up here? And either you can go first, I don't care. Sure, um, uh, how about I go <laughs> first? And it's, it's hard when there's, there's two people in here, but, um, but yeah, so for, for me, it was really a, a winding road to inclusive design. I didn't necessarily um, know from the very beginning that I, I was gonna end up here. So it was certainly a, a really pleasant surprise. So um, I started my undergraduate uh, degree in studio art at McMaster University. So um, after that, I um, ended up uh, staying at McMaster, working in higher education for a little bit. Um, and, and also uh, along the side, um, I was painting um, and, and doing a few exhibitions. And then after that, I ended up um, going to Beijing to work in uh, a commercial art gallery called Long March Space. And uh, it was really there where uh, I, I've, I've really fell in love with the city. And um, there, there were so many things, like uh, exciting things happening at that time, especially um, in the art space um, with really, really innovative um, exhibitions happening. Um, but it was really when I was living there that kind of uh, sort of sparked my my interest um, in inclusion and social impact. Um, and one of the reasons why, uh, specifically in terms of my interest in built environment, was because uh, as I was living in the city, uh, Beijing is sort of built out in, in rings. So the oldest part is sort of in the center. Um, and as, uh, as time passed, they sort of started expanding uh, further and further out. And so, um, there was not uh, really efficient planning and there were a lot of barriers in the way that, that the city was uh, designed and built. And so uh, at the same time, a lot of people were uh, sort of coming into the city looking for jobs, uh, um, going to school and often uh, alone and uh, far away from their families and very isolated. And so I could see um, this really big need for community, but also the, the barriers to, to form strong communities because uh, of, those, of those challenges to connect. And so I, I came back and I was looking into programs and uh, OCAD just happened to have a really great program um, for, for inclusive design. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how, how I started and that's why I applied. How long were you in um, Beijing for? So I was there working uh, for about one year, but actually before that, and the reason why I, I ended up uh, going to Beijing to look for work is because right after my undergraduate, I, I had a, an artist residency there okay. as well. And so I spent about uh, two months uh, sort of 
living in a, in a studio um, and there were sort of other shared studios in the same complex, um, artists from all over the world. Um, and we were just able to have dedicated time to be able to uh, produce work um, and sort of get to know different types of arts practices as well. Okay, I feel, Nikki, like I should have known that about you, but for some reason I didn't know that. <laughs> like, I always used to associate you in my mind, like, Nikki loves spaces. I know Nikki's about spaces. Like, she's, she's got the spaces down. But I didn't know, like, that's where it's all started. So that's super cool. <laughs> so, Grace, how did you end up in inclusive design? Yeah, for me, uh, I'm a graphic designer too. So pretty much... Uh, I was kind of engaged in all the creative side. So I did my undergraduate back home, which is Ecuador. And then when I moved here, uh, one of the first opportunities I had was to work in an agency that belongs to the government, specifically to the Ministry of, of Health. So I was there for like at least like three months. After that, uh, I was kind of just jumping all over. So kind of trying different type of agencies and so on. And then again, I had that opportunity to go back there. And uh, just like, I guess it's, it was the exposure to people and to different audiences. So uh, being part of the communications department, it was kind of just very eye opening because it, was, it wasn't just the designer there, but actually kind of just organizing and managing some of the, the things that comes, right? So the request that comes. So uh, eventually I think the spark came through that. Uh, just for the fact that, okay, it's like there are different audiences, so how can I actually help them to like create uh, something that, you know, we require our standards, but it's kind of simple and easier for them, you know? So I guess uh, I, I was also uh, in trying to go for my master's and uh, at that point, the accessibility and compliance that the government is applying here in Canada came into effect. And... Uh, I, I thought, oh, wow, inclusive design, so it makes sense. Uh, being honest, I perhaps was expecting like, oh, you know, in here, these are the things that you have to do, you know, so kind of that structural uh, um, learning, I guess. But when I joined the program, it was totally different and uh, it superpassed what I was expecting, really. And uh, I'm pretty, pretty happy because it actually kind of changed or switch the way I work now. So it was a pleasant experience uh, overall. So that's how I ended up there. That sounds very, very interesting, Grace. Mm -hmm. I, uh, going back a little to when you were back, when we were together back uh, doing the, the graduate program, how did you both uh, decided to work together and unite forces on your research. I know you both ha were designing and were very interested in kids and in spaces. Tell us about your research focus, your process, how the collaboration went, and a little bit of the outcome of the study. Sure, so I can start here. <laughs> so being honest with you, um, I didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do at that point. And it was because like, uh, you remember Peter, the, our director from the, from the program, he came with a bunch of ideas and just like maybe brainstorming a little bit and kind of just trying to learn what I want to do and what actually kind of just, um, I was interested in. I think I ended up uh, partnering with uh, Nikki. So uh, I guess uh, it was interesting for me to explore a little bit more about children uh, with special needs and the fact that they were an, in, in a state of mind that they were open to whatever we can come up with and the opportunity that they have, uh, the real opportunity that they have uh, in this point, it will be that they were building a, a new facility. So it make it even more interesting because it was something that uh, it's going to be implemented somehow. So uh, I guess that's how I ended up uh, partnering with my partner. <laughs> yeah, here. <laughs> and and just building off what, what Grace was saying, it was um, really, really just ha happenstance that we got partnered because um, uh, I think for me at the very get-go, I was like, I'm, I'm interested in built environment. This is what I want to do. And then it just so happens that um, 
Peter was connected with Grandview Kids, who was the industry partner we ended up working with. Um, and then it was just sort of at, at every moment through our lab courses, through uh, research methods. Um, it, it just so happens that as we were brainstorming ideas, Grace and I just kept on matching. Um, even when we were doing uh, a course about multi building multi-sensory translation models, we ended up um, just having similar interests. And so uh, I guess the stars kind of aligned. And then uh, one thing that I really wanted to say about this project too is that um, be beyond uh, the collaboration between me and Grace, it really ended up being um, a, a really big collaboration with the broader community. And so we had a lot of support from Grandview, uh, from the staff there, from the therapist's family and the, and the kids, yep. and also the um, architects who were, who were doing some of the design work for Grandview. Um, and, and so we ended up building sort of this larger network and support system of people who really cared about the same problem, but offered a lot of uh, different perspectives, especially um, really, really valuable lived experience. What about uh, the outcome of the research, like the, what you ended up uh, designing and co-designing? Uh, okay, so basically for my end, uh, what I ended up designing was a transitional support system. Based on the interviews that we had, like, and also by observation, uh, there was a recurrent theme that I was able to differentiate, which was transitions. So as you know, transitions is like, has different effects in, in, in everybody. So when you don't know where you're going, it's like this type of a stress or so that actually affects the way uh, you perceive the environment or your feeling and so on. So basically uh, the point was that children with special needs had to go to these children treatment centers, but there is a process, right? So people have to prepare before they're going, while they're in the center and after the visit. So basically for me, it was kind of just taking the pieces that were already built and try to create this connection between them that will allow them to have and a start and a finish. So the idea behind it is to provide, like in the start, um, most, inf the most uh, information as possible. So for example, if the children are going there, it's like, okay, so this is what the steps that we're gonna take. This is the people that you're gonna meet. And these are the spaces that we, we will have to navigate. So uh, it was just like developing these tools, these kind of toolkits and also combining it with, uh, uh, with wayfinding inside the physical space so everything has a connection so um at the end of the day it was kind of you know it's a cycle so you start here in this point and then you close that and overall it was kind of just uh, with the aim that children will feel like the behavioral uh, issues that they have will be kind of minimized and that will help them to uh, have better outcomes in the treatments because most of the time they are super, uh, super stressed. And let's say the, the therapist will have to go there and spend like, let's say 20 minutes or, or less trying to calm down them. And that was a, a, a time that could have been like uh, utilized for the actual treatment. So it was this kind of recollection of data that we did through um, the, the same structure interviews, the observation, and then finally just to kind of, um, it would be, a uh, uh, just uh, um, having like a, a, this co-design session where they actually have the pieces and they uh, establish which was the, the level of severity uh, of behaviors that they have at, at which point that allowed me to develop this transitional support system. That's super interesting. Yeah. Sounds great. And what about yours, Nikki? What was your outcome and how did it connect with Grace's? Yeah, and, and I think the thing that really ties um, my project and Grace's project is is really creating a, an inclusive user experience um, that that provides clarity, that that provides comfort and and just a sense of welcoming. And so, um, for me, the thing that was produced was a sensory design guideline uh, to ensure that children's treatment centers are designed uh, inclusively and and 
uh, are responsive to sensory needs of a broad range of users. Um, and so considering that within Canada, one, one fifth of our population are uh, persons with, with disabilities and um, among uh, both children with uh, uh, autism and, and also uh, with not, uh, many children have uh, sensory processing uh, disorders and so which affect uh, the way that they process sort of different sensory stimuli and the way that they understand the sensory stimuli and so um, having having uh, environments that are uh, really responsive to their needs also allows them to um, receive better uh, better therapies and and really be able to focus on on what they're there in the treatment centers for because uh, treatment centers across Ontario, they really serve uh, children and youth from zero to uh, about 18 or maximum 21 years of age. Um, but then after that, uh, they need to, they, they may not be able to access those services anymore. And so it's really, really important that as early as possible, they receive uh, these types of therapies and, and that uh, if there are any barriers to that, including the uh, barriers within the design of the building that might um, impede focus or, or might make a child uh, uncomfortable, um, that we can address those um, as much as possible. Uh, typically, um, guidelines or, or standards, they often, in terms of accessibility, they often address physical accessibility, but not necessarily um, uh, addressing more sensory or cognitive uh, disabilities. And so being able to, uh, draw from from uh, the lived experiences of our participants and bringing that to the forefront of our uh, of the sensory design guideline was very very important so you guys are saying like how you guys worked with grandview and a wider network of uh, professionals who are actually implementing your, um, like your the, the work as well as your part of the research it contributes to it are you guys um, continuing to work with them in any way or is it like your part is kind of complete and you're moving on to other things and they're going to take it from there or how does it work mm -hmm. so, uh, so, so, I can that. so in terms of um where where we're at uh, so we've uh provided these uh transitional supports and, and the sensory design guidelines to Grandview. Um, so they are available and they, they have been looking at them and they uh, will be implemented in, in their new build. Um, and so hopefully, um, from what I gather, by this time next year, they will start building, <laughs> is the hope. But we never know during the pandemic, everything is sort of a surprise. Um, uh, but at this point, I think um, our, our piece is sort of wrapped up. Uh, and they've included our research in their compliance documents. So whoever will be designing the building uh, should be incorporating those those pieces. So how has inclusive design changed you? Like how has the transition been like for you post-graduation, re-entering into like the regular design world, if you want to call it that? Um, and what are your ambitions moving forward? Yeah, so for me, uh, I will say it changed me like completely. Yeah. So yeah, and even like just uh, having the experience of working with Grand Kids and my MRP overall, uh, it just uh, opened my eyes to how valuable is, for example, the work that people uh, people do with uh, children overall. So uh, I guess uh, in the workplace that I'm right now, uh, one of the focus for me was actually, okay, so how can I contribute to create uh, materials, products or services that can actually help these individuals prob uh, create something that is valuable and that could be like helpful for children. So I guess, that is an example, but uh, overall, it's that's how I felt it had changed my yeah. way of thinking. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's about like what can I actually provide there that uh, could be valuable for the people that are working there because it's like kind of teaching something, 
and at the other in the other hand is like kind of gaining some knowledge from them and yeah. trying to combine these two forces to create something for the benefit of this other third and fourth you know uh audience yeah. and it's kind of just this kind of connective system that's how i see it because it's like when you work with someone and you try to build something that there there will be this other ramification that actually gets benefit yeah so yeah overall it's like it's uh inclusive design is uh is kind of the motto <laughs> of how a designer should be working for sure <laughs> connective system is definitely the right term <laughs> i feel that way too it's like we're always connected yeah. to the office <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you nikki uh absolutely and uh for for me the same i just Honestly, during uh, the program, I just felt like my brain was stretched. <laughs> um, and and uh, I felt challenged uh, every day to, to really think through uh, even uh, a lot of my own personal biases and, and really relearning how to, to listen and um, uh, learn new ways to, to, to see a, a problem. And so for, for myself, um, I, I feel like I'm continuing to learn, but how it really fits into my uh, broader life beyond school. Um, as, as I mentioned sort of before the podcast started, I've, I've been doing a lot of interviews because I have been looking for work. Um, and uh, I'm really excited to be um, sort of uh, joining a, a firm soon. And so uh, actually through the interviews, I, I had a lot of conversations about how accessibility and inclusion could be worked in to um, either their policy work or their events work or their strategy development. And it was really, really exciting to see other people starting to um, really have a deep focus and making this a priority. Um, and so I think one of the things that I particularly enjoy um, is, is being able to work with uh, different stakeholders um, and to solve problems to, together. And I think that's something that I'm really looking forward to seeing more of in, in the future. So talking exactly about that, when, when you talk with others about inclusion and diversity and accessibility, what do you think you need to explain more? Like when you're, when you're talking with people that are not experts or this stakeholders that, that you have been interviewing with, what, is, what, do you have, what do you find you have to explain the most? Both of you. <laughs> uh, sure, um, I, I can take this one first because I, I found after the program, I've, I've been trying to have a, way more conversations um, with, with um, everybody in, in my life, it, with my family, with my friends, um, some, some of them having uh, a bit more knowledge and some not. Um, and I think first and foremost, I, I'm not necessarily trying to explain anything because I really, really want to understand where they're coming from. And I feel like everybody is truly, they're an expert of their own experience. Um, and I'm sure everybody has faced uh, some sort of exclusion, although um, definitely certain people have, have faced ex way, way more than others. And so um, I think starting from a point of trying to understand and listen, um, and then from that start a conversation to be able to perhaps challenge different perspectives of um, being able to understand perhaps a different way of experiencing something because um i mean the, the same thing for example the same thing could happen to two people but they could experience it completely different depending on um their personal experiences the identities that they bring forward um and all of that shapes uh their their experience um and and so i think it's really just having that conversation and trying to find new, new ways of looking at something. Grace? Yeah. Yeah, so in my case, uh, I just kind of, kind of going back to interviews and so on, uh, I remember that, for example, trying to explain inclusion, it was just a matter of fact of uh, um, explaining, it's like, do you know, like, 
from your products or your services is like, which is the feedback that you have got from your audience? And most of the time it was like, you know, that's a very good question. And then it was the time for me to say, oh, oh, you know what? So that's what we're talking when we're, we're saying inclusion. So it's just like hear what the other end has to say and not have like the bias that pretty much like uh, most of organiz organizations have them because it's like the fact of, oh, you are producing something that you think is valuable for others, but you are not actually kind of having or ma making the time to have that feedback, uh, that retroalimentation, right? Yeah. So I guess that was for me the most simple way to explain it. And uh, considering like, for example, the, the marketing world is like, uh, it's interesting because they like one of the principles of many of the principles that then having marketed, uh, doing marketing does is like, okay, you have to know your audience, but how many times do you actually uh, um, involve them into the process. So that was something that was, was very interesting for me too, because you are talking all the time about audiences, audiences, but at the end of the day, it's like, I guess you just have one contact with them and that's all. And then these, these are the two products that you can choose from. And you are just not uh, involving them in something else that they might think uh, is valuable, right? I really love that because actually that made me think on a quote that we actually posted on uh, the Hello Manifold uh, social media that was that said that diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance, right? So that, that made me think of that, like how they want us to know them, but when, when in, what is the difference between making them part of the process or really, really making them instead of us? I, I think it's a big deal now for a lot of companies to, to um, incorporate diversity and inclusion initiatives, but like they understand things in their mind, but it's not yet like embodied it's not integrated. It's just not a natural way of doing things um, mm -hmm. as yet. So it's very, very hard because particularly like in this climate, everybody wants to be more inclusive and so forth. But then it's like everybody's also still just trying to survive the pandemic. I think businesses in particular. So it's a lot um, to juggle. Um, but that brings me to my next question, which is, um, so given that there are so many people who are, I think, well-intended, like have good intentions and they want to do better, but they're everyday people and maybe they don't have the education that we have, for example, in inclusive design. And we went through a two-year process that, as Grace said, changed us. They don't have that and maybe they just don't know where to start and this is something that i've been asking everybody it's like a little research of my own um what do you think is one thing or thought that everyday people can adopt now to be more inclusive i think sort of even from from the get-go something that we could uh, I think it's always important to share is um, is is pieces that support learning and um, uh, in all the ways that people learn and um, just being able to also change the mindset of how we think about people, how we categorize people, often the ways that we um, when we're trying to problem solve and we make a design decision. Um, exactly like what you said, uh, we can accidentally cause um, exclusion. And um, bringing it back to the sort of Cat uh, Holmes is like, exclusion and inclusion is not necessarily bad, but it should always be intentional um, and, and thoughtful. And, um, and so thinking through uh, perhaps who, who currently is excluded. So whether it's um, in an educational setting, um, I, was, I was recently a graduate teaching assistant, so thinking of like, okay, who's uh, might who might be having trouble accessing the course, who who might be excluded, or if you're a business, um, 
uh, selling, who, who used to have a brick and mortar store and now is selling goods online, between those transitions and, and, um, and that change with that circumstance, who now has more affordances because of online shopping, but then who also is more excluded. So perhaps um, those who might not be able to uh, leave their house as much to go to a brick and mortar store now can have uh, better access to those uh, services, but perhaps um, somebody who uh, is perhaps uh, older and may not have the technological um, knowledge to shop online, um, or, or even that trust with online shopping, they may all of a sudden not be able to buy those products. And so um, sort of really, really being able to, with, with every decision, think through how, how has that impacted um, the people who I'm really trying to serve? Mm -hmm. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, so for me, uh, I think there's nothing bad on having good intentions, yeah. but when you try to be inclusive, uh, it could actually be more harmful, I, I will say, because at the end of the day, your biases will be the ones that dictate your good intentions and not necessarily the needs of the the people that uh, you're trying to help. Um, I guess it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult, I will say at the start, perhaps for some people it's scary as well, because you exactly, you don't know how can you actually be, what is inclusion? Let's put it that way, okay? So, but I think uh, one of the, the, the tools that all of us have learned is uh, the fact that you take the time to listen. And by doing so, uh, and I don't want to say, uh, to use that. I don't want to use the the typical phrase. Oh, just wear the other shoes because uh, at the end of the day, you will never know what actually the other people had to endure. But at least you are open your mind to learn about what uh, they have to say, and try to shift uh, your thinking in the way that uh, could be beneficial for both of us. So it's. Uh, is a win and win for both. Mm -hmm. Can I add something to that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it just also makes me think like, you know, when, I, when I've been talking to people um, who may not be uh, as experienced in this, in this space, um, I, I feel like there's a big sentiment of, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert, I don't know how to do this. Um, right. and, and therefore, you know, I, I shouldn't be the person uh, implementing these things. Um, but I think something that I really want to emphasize is that um, we, we all have the power and the capacity to create change. Um, and so being able to, I think us um, having gone through the, the program, being able to also encourage others to have that confidence um, and to not be afraid to have those hard conversations with others um, and and challenge uh, their own perspectives because I find with with good intention it also takes a lot of bravery um, to to look deep inside yourself and and challenge your own biases and your and the things that you currently bring to the table and how those can be improved and they um, in terms of inclusion can only be improved when we have a better understanding of um, others, especially people who we don't often interact with. And I think with the sometimes um, uh, people might, might not have interact with uh, others who are really, really different. And sometimes that's where stigma also comes from. Um, it's sort of a, 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 a social thing that has um, been created uh, to also, it, it's something that is a tool that suppresses others and it comes from a lack of understanding. And so what, what can we do to, um, uh, to just have better representation um, within our communities, better connections and networks? Really, really, that's a, you guys are so smart. <laughs> You are. <laughs> <You're so smart. laughs> like what you were mentioning, Nikki, was something that I be that I was um, reading about the other day about how uh, what is like action bias, 
and when you find something that uncomfortable for you and then you try to fix it really quick because you feel like uncomfortable or you feel like embarrassed or ashamed that certain thing can happen in your workspace or in your family or in your friend circles. So even before you try to understand or define the problem and understand it from the perspective of who is being excluded, you just try to fix, 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 fix. And that, then that doesn't really solve the problem or sometimes it silences more the people that were being excluded, right? So that was really interesting as a reminding, reminding for me especially because I am always like in a hurry to solve things and sometimes I just need to listen more. Sometimes de first define and then start uh, understanding and then fixing, right? <laughs> it was super, super nice to, to like always, like again, being in class to listen to you. Yeah, thank you guys. Actually, yeah, we were so excited to be here too. So it's like, yes, perfect opportunity to catch up. <laughs> yeah, this is so nice. And just hearing from, from also everybody else who just sort of how, how the program has changed us and sort of where our mindsets are, are at now. It's, it's pretty incredible. And I'm really happy that we, we got to study together. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Good. Thank you for no. doing this for us. Thanks for listening to our conversation with Nikki and Grace. I hope that you learned something. And if you're interested in anything that you heard here today and you want to find out more, or if you just like to connect with either Nikki or Grace, then please check out the description of this episode or head on over to our website so you can read the show notes at hellomanifold.com forward slash conversations.